Coming up, we've got parts design and fabrication for Project Gigawatt. Episode four starts now. One of the biggest challenges with an EV conversion is to adapt the vehicle to parts that it wasn't designed for. Sometimes it's pretty easy, like the front battery box in the DeLorean. It's fully frame supported, and this box of four Tesla Model S modules fits great. It protrudes slightly into the front trunk, but it leaves a surprising amount of space around it when it's fully installed. So this will be a, still a very usable area. In the rear of the car, it used to have the engine and transaxle, and now that's wide open, and it's the perfect amount of room for the remaining 12 battery modules to complete the 100 kilowatt hour battery pack. This area you can see is wide open, yet it lacks structure to support the battery boxes, so we need to start making some strong mounts for these boxes. Starting with the upper box, this will be a tray that doubles as not only the battery support, but it also becomes the strut tower brace that was removed in order to make room for this. So it needs to be securely mounted, and unfortunately there's not a lot of access behind it for the backer nuts in the frame. Normally you could use a rivet nut or something like that, but since this is a high stress part, I decided to make some backer wrenches that will live in the car. So these are uh, CNC cut and the nut is welded to them. And then I bent a little tab so that once you put it into the access hole and you bolt it down, that tab becomes the backer wrench. So you can really get a very good clamp load on this and it'll be a, a nice secure with a, a wide flange. So it's, uh, it's gonna be a very durable part. For the lower aft box, I knew I wanted to drop it down deep into the frame, but I did not want to just hang it off the cantilevered frame rails. So these gusseted mounts that double as bodywork for protection for the boxes fit the shape of the frame really nice. And I sort of angled it back up to the tail so these not only gusset and strengthen the frame, they support the battery box and they also provide protection as bodywork. So this worked out really well. The bottom box will secure to this lower portion and then the upper box will be suspended just slightly above it. So each of the three battery boxes are independently mounted and so they're not putting too much of a load in just one location. So I CNC cut these out and it's nice the way the DeLorean frame is shaped. They have a nice taper to them and then they taper up from the back as well. So it makes a pretty clean look. It does not hang down uh, too low. The only thing I had to modify on the frame further was the original toe loops. They didn't seem strong enough, so I wanted a crossbar. We did some stress testing with, uh, this is Clint. He's been helping me with the project and he's got an awesome project coming up soon. I can't wait to start on but this was just rock solid. It's barely bolted in. Uh, so really uh, happy with the way this turned out. So it, the way the boxes have to fit, this lower box has to lay on its side. So that's a, another one of these identical four boxes with four modules. That one's on its side. It tucks nicely under the upper forward tray. And then this will be the uh, arrangement how they have to be installed as well. So it'll start with the lower aft then the upper front, and then finally the, uh, the upper aft. The final requirement for these aft batteries is to fit completely in the engine compartment under the engine cover, which they do. These vents will end up being plexi or glass at some point, so you can look down and see the tops of the batteries. And then the bodywork painted to match the trim of the car with this matte black. It gives it uh, kind of an OEM look that I'm always going for. I hope someone would walk up to this car and not suspect that it's a conversion, but that it just looks like a nice clean car. Moving on to the cooling system, I wanted the radiators for the motor cooling in the back of the car. So these are going to be in the battery compartment. And there was a perfect spot in these compartments on either side of the engine bay where it used to have air intake on one side. And there's quite a bit of room inside these compartments, which were vented from the outside. You can see these factory vents, which will push some airflow through this compartment and through the radiator. So the radiators are I found are nice and slim. 
kind of a long short design and they're a double pass so both fittings are on one tank so it goes through and come, returns and passes through again. The only problem with the fittings is they were centered and I needed them offset to get the plumbing done the way I need it. So I just cut them off, patched the holes and re-welded the fittings back on. Also the tabs, they do the job but they were not a good look and so I wanted a full perimeter flange to not only support and mount the radiator but to trim out the compartment where they will be mounted. I cut these with bend tabs so you can weld the tabs on flat to the edge of the radiator so you get a nice square look versus trying to edge weld where you get uh, a little bit of warping tends to happen. So these were mirror image uh, flanges with the tabs so they're the, the same left to right and uh, they fit the compartment really nice and it's going to be just a perfect uh, location for these radiators. I did want to add cooling fans just for slower speeds or hotter weather or when battery charging uh, so you can cool the batteries with these radiators. This is a spall pusher fan. I was able to mount two per radiator with this shroud. The shroud has a nice tight clearance to the radiator so I installed rib nuts backwards which makes it kind of like a mounting stud. Um, so it'll have uh, 1400 CFM uh, total system capacity with the airflow along with that ram air when driving and everything fits all uh, behind the scenes so a uh, nice clean look and that's the first piece of the puzzle for the cooling system. There are a number of additional components for the thermal management system two Tesla water pumps and two Tesla switching valves. So I've got one three-way valve and one four-way valve to configure multiple ways depending on the needs of the car. All of these components need brackets and mounting locations. Luckily, there was plenty of room below the upper forward battery box and above the Model 3 Performance drive unit. Once I had good locations figured out, I started to design and cut brackets. Like this one for the dual water pumps, they mount on the same plane, but they have a stair step so that there is no interference for routing the hoses to and from the pumps. And they're still hanging on their factory isolators, so it should be a nice, quiet operation. This bracket then was welded to the upper battery tray, and that whole unit will install together. So there's plenty of clearance below. I can install this as I'm installing the battery boxes. All of these components and connections will be made at the same time. There's also room for a bracket for the switching valves. And those valves uh, have a couple T's and elbows to get all of the configurations uh, necessary for all of the functions that I'm planning, which I'll go over next. Here is the general graphical diagram of the thermal management system. We've got the two pumps. We have a heater, a chiller, a heater core, the motor, the batteries, and then the switching valves. Now we're looking at the battery loop flow. So we start from the reservoir, which feeds the pump to the heater, the heater core, then back through a four-way valve into the chiller, the battery pack, and returning to the reservoir. For battery cooling, the flow remains the same, but we turn on the chiller. This chiller uses refrigerant from the AC compressor to chill the battery pack, but the flow remains just the same as it was before. In this same configuration, when battery heat is required, the heater would turn on and the battery would come up to the desired set temperature. The next mode would be the heater mode. So we can bypass the battery loop and just do a short loop, which would be from the heater to the heater core and back through the heater. So this would be a short loop just for maximum heater core heat using the same heater as the battery. Next, we have the motor loop. From the reservoir, we feed the pump that goes through the inverter and motor cooling, then returns to the valve manifold, which passes through the radiator and back to the reservoir. The motor loop has the additional option of bypassing the radiator, which would not be normally used for normal motor operation unless we want to capture that heat 
and use it for the batteries. Next, we can look at the combined systems in a cold day scenario. In this scenario, the heater is providing heat to the heater core in a closed loop, while the motor could be in radiator bypass mode, which would put more heat into the battery pack. Once the battery pack gets up to its desired temperature, we can put the radiator back into the system to maintain that temperature by removing heat from the motor before it circulates through the battery pack. With this scenario, we maintain optimum performance of the heater core for passenger comfort. The next scenario would be on a warm day where the two loops are configured in their normal flow. So the battery loop is separate from the motor loop and the radiator is cooling the motor. The next scenario would be when battery cooling is required, the flow would remain the same where the radiator cools the motor and the AC chiller would turn on to cool the battery to maintain its desired temperature. The system also has battery charging configuration which would use the motor loop and the radiator to cool the batteries while we are charging. We can take it to one more level with high current charging like DC fast charging, and we can incorporate the AC chiller, which would maintain battery temperature even at very high current levels. In order to maintain temperature in the battery pack, each box needs coolant manifolds to evenly distribute coolant to all 32 cooling loops in the battery pack. I used eighth inch wall one by one aluminum tubing and I jigged them up into the CNC plasma table so it could evenly cut all of the holes as well as cutting the manifolds to length. Then I just cleaned them up and they were ready to weld these aluminum fittings. I had to jig the fittings from the bottom and the top. I put a spacer in so they were the desired height and then I capped them with this top jig in order to get them all square. Just tacked them into place and then I could go and weld a few beads on each one at a time and rotate. And I got a pretty good system down to where it didn't take too long. Once they were all fully welded, I capped them off to pressure test and check for any leaks. Now I've got all eight of these manifolds ready to go and 64 fittings total. We just have to get them mounted in the battery boxes. Next episode, I'll go into the high voltage contactor box, which has all of the contactors for motor and fast charging and accessories. And also I'll look at the low voltage design of the relay fuse and bus bar module that will be tying all of the original car systems to the new car systems. Thanks for watching. See you next time.